We've been talking about doctrine, and last week we started on how to study the Bible, and I wanted to continue this week, and I wanted to just show you here in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 is not in your notes, so you have to look up at the screen, but I want to show you one of the reasons why this is so important for the day and the time that we live. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And that relates to what I was saying uh, during the worship service, that God wants to use you to edify one another. And I realize that for some people, we, uh, at this point in time, we seem to be more of a kind of a conservative congregation, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Not a whole lot of people dancing in the aisles, I've noticed. But... Uh, if you did want to dance in the aisles, there wouldn't be anything wrong with that if you want to dance unto the Lord as David did. Uh, and yet at the same time, some of us may be more vocal, more articulate than others, but if you ever sense in your heart that the Lord wants to use you to speak something, speak up, because our job here is to build each other up, the body of Christ. And uh, it's my job to make sure that uh, the environment is set here and that you are equipped to do so. And that's another reason why it's so important that uh, I make sure that you know personally how to study the Bible and not just depend upon me. You have to know what you believe. You can't just ride off of me and my faith. And so to do that, you have to be able to seek out truth and establish truth on your own. Verse 13 here, it says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so God's plan for your life is not necessarily that you become CEO of some company or some professional uh, football player. Or God's plan for your life is that you grow up to be just like Jesus. That is the highest goal, the greatest privilege you could ever have, to be like Jesus. Worth more than any earthly fame or recognition or position or status. You're to be like Jesus. And so that's what we're growing up into. And then he says in verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of what? Doctrine. And boy, through the years, I was just going through in my own mind and thinking uh, for the span of my life, I remember back in, uh, I guess it was the 70s probably, the late 70s, early 80s. Remember when we went through the thing where the teaching was really strong about the authority of the believer and uh, the, the prosperity gospel was being taught back then. It was the, uh, the name, it, uh, name it, claim it crowd. Remember all of those different uh, doctrines that were going around? And at that time, there was a lot of good that was done by those movements. I see it a lot like uh, with Martin Luther, Thank God for Martin Luther and the boys, right, and the Reformation and the freedom that they brought from, the, from Roman Catholicism. How needed was that for the church at that time? And yet when you do a, a, a kind of a thorough study of the doctrines of Martin Luther, you wouldn't necessarily agree with everything. But yet he got the movement, Christianity, moving in the right direction, and thank God for it. Um, you know, even us today, I'm sure that there are a lot of things that I don't know, that I am ignorant of. Uh, there's probably a lot of things in my teaching and in my doctrine that need tweaking and need uh, slight corrections here and there. And uh, hopefully I have an open heart to always hear the Spirit of God and make those corrections as we go along. But I'm just saying, nobody has ever got it perfectly right except Jesus Christ. But we're trying. And the goal here is to stay as biblically pure as we possibly can. Some of the things that are uh, red flags today in the church, and I've mentioned this, are like the emergent church. And the emergent church really strongly changes doctrine where kind of anything goes, you can live any way that you like, God understands, um, completely in opposition to the teaching of the cross. Uh, another movement that you hear a little bit less about today is the missional uh, movement, where 
they believe that um, we are to go into the world and just blend with the world. And that for too long, it's always been the church and them, us and them. And we need to tear down that wall. And, you know, uh, some, some have gone even as so far as to do away with churches altogether. And let's just get together and have a discussion group or something along those lines. That's, that's, that's taking it too far. That's not biblical. Uh, yes, we are to go into all the world. And we are to be involved in their lives. And we are to be sharing with them the gospel. And we are to be, have, a, have a heart of compassion for the lost and for the broken and for the needy. At the same time, simultaneous, and this is what we've been teaching, we are to come out from among them and be different. So we're to be in the world, but not of the world. We're to be involved in their lives, yet at the same time, uh, we can't allow any worldly influence to change our beliefs or to change our lifestyle. So there's a real balance there, isn't there? And he says that part of this growing up is so that you can mature to the place where you're not being batted around by every wind of doctrine. Well, what do I believe now? Or what do they believe now? Or what are they teaching now? Or you need to come to a place of being settled and at peace in the truth knowing what you believe by the word of God because you've searched it out for yourself. 1 Timothy chapter 4 gives us this warning, and this is really the impetus and the reason why we're studying this. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of what? Teaching of demons. And those teachings of demons they don't announce themselves. They don't come to you and say, hey, this is a doctrine from the devil. You know, they, uh, they make it look real good, don't they? As we've discussed, Satan knows how to quote scripture. And false teachers know how to quote scriptures and make it sound real good. So we have to be real discerning. And we have to know the truth. The more you will know the truth, the more you will be able to identify the false. Okay? So let's get into what we want to share this morning. We want to finish up from last week what we started. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. And I've got to stop here, and I've got to ask the question, this past week, did you do your best? Did you crack open the Bible? Did you read? Did you study? Are you being obedient to this verse? Are you building and establishing your belief system of what you know to be true from the Bible? You're to be someone who rightly handles the word of truth. And we're going to look at these seven ways once again. Last week we got through the first three. Today, God willing, we'll get through the last four. But last week we, uh, we talked about illumination, context, and comparison. This is how you establish sound doctrine. Today we're going to talk about history, language, meditation, and application, just to kind of round it out. And we said that this was not a formula. Uh, this was not obligatory in any way. There's going to be times where you just open up your book and just begin to read because you just need some time with the Lord. You know, so this is not a systematic study to where you've got to go through all of these steps every time you crack open the Bible. But you do need to be aware of these seven processes in proper Bible study so that you can determine what's right and what's wrong. All right, number one, illumination, just a quick review. Insight and understanding in the scripture is supernatural, imparted by the Holy Spirit. And like we said last week, if you don't start with the illumination of the Holy Spirit, forget about the other six, they, don't, they won't matter. If you don't have the Holy Spirit opening your eyes, you will never understand Scripture. It is the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a supernatural book that requires supernatural illumination. You will have no insight, no understanding into what it means and what it's saying until you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. We saw that from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Number two, context. You've got to take statements in context. You can't pull a verse out of the context and arrive at the truth of what it's saying. We put there a statement taken out of context can become very distorted, deceptive, dangerous to our faith. Last week we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, when 
Paul has given instructions to this church, and he says, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And we just use this as an example because you could use this over and over and over again. If you just took these two verses out of context, wow, you could come up with some really scary doctrine, couldn't you? But So we showed you these two verses last week and then we went through and read the whole chapter and, and the context begins to build on itself and you begin to see why this was being said and how it was supposed to happen and when it was supposed to happen and the pieces started to come together with the context. So don't take verses out of context. Always see the surrounding context to come to the real truth of what it's saying. We talked uh, last week about comparison. When a biblical passage or principle is emphasized to the diminishment or exclusion of other related scriptures, the result is the exaggeration or the distortion of the principle. And I think one of the classic examples would be, uh, do we believe in salvation by works or salvation by faith? And we know that salvation is by faith. It comes by the grace of Jesus Christ. It's nothing that we can earn or deserve. It's not of our works. It's freely by the mercy of God and the provision of the cross of Jesus Christ. Yet at the same time, you go over to James and it says faith without works is what? It's dead. Now, do those two principles negate each other? No. Actually, when you understand it properly, they support each other and they bring you to the balance of truth. The fact of the matter is you are saved, redeemed and sanctified by faith in Christ and Christ alone. But if that faith is not alive and working and it's, if it's not producing corresponding works of obedience, then you really don't have faith. And that's the whole point of the book of James. You know the book of James almost didn't make it into the canon? Because there was a great dispute about wow, what is this contradictory, uh, what is this contradictory doctrine being taught here? And it's really not contradictory, it really strengthens and supports being saved by faith. Uh, it gives a much clearer picture of what true faith is. Faith is not just mental assent. Faith is not just some credence that you uh, that you say on Sundays. Faith has got to be alive and real in your heart and it's got to be changing your heart and changing your life or else it's not faith. And that's the whole point that James was making. So if you, if you just erred on the side of emphasizing um, you know, faith without works is dead and you got into a works performance type relationship with the Lord, that's an error, that's exaggerated. But if you swung to the other side and just said, oh well, I can live any way I want, and I'm always saved because I believe it, I have faith, that's an error too. And so there's got to be this comparison of principles where we arrive to the balance of truth, and I've got to move on. Number four, history. Biblical content can be misunderstood and misinterpreted if the historical context is not properly understood. This can get... Uh, this can get a little bit more academic than all of the others, but it's a very necessary part of the process. I was just talking a couple days ago to someone about what Jesus said about divorce. And you know, when Jesus uh, spoke about divorce, that divorce is really not permitted unless there has been uh, adultery or unfaithfulness, that's, that's a really good example, and we're not going to get into it this morning, but you really need to understand the historical background of what he was saying and why he was saying that and who he was speaking to, okay? Uh, mainly the Pharisees. Because you've got to understand what he was addressing when he was addressing it, and that historical context is really not readily available. You're going to have to do some research. And the research that we do historically into these matters I've listed here a few of the commentaries that are really good, that I would recommend. And these commentaries now are so prevalent and so free. I can remember when Terry and I were engaged, and I would go out to her house on the weekends, I would bring this big briefcase full of books, you know, just uh, to study. Just all types of commentaries and lexicons and, 
Yeah, that sounds like an exciting date, doesn't it? But, uh, and, but these are all available online for free now. Barnes Notes, Clark's Commentaries. Uh, my personal favorites are actually the first three. Barnes, Clark's, and Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown are really good. I really like Barnes the best because he's just so clear and so concise. Kyle and Delich, you know, if you've got four hours that you need to waste, uh, waste, I shouldn't say waste. Kyle and Delich is excellent. I didn't mean to give the wrong impression. I'm just saying, you're going to be there a while. And you're probably going to need a dictionary to look up some of the words that they're using, okay? And the same with the pulpit commentary. Uh, pulpit commentary is very intense, very detailed. Matthew Henry is, is very good, but he's very wordy. So again, if, if you've got some time to kill, uh, you, can, you can go to him. But Barnes, Clarks, and then the, we always used to call it the J, JFB, uh, they are more concise and just straight to the point. Then you can also go to uh, Bible dictionaries. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the names off the top of my head, but some of the Bible dictionaries are very good. What did I say? Did I say my parents? Oh, okay. You don't want any, you don't want any scandalous rumors flying around? Okay. <laughs> Yes, we were properly chaperoned. I guess we should make that clear. Thank you, Terry, for keeping me safe. But uh, here in the book of Ruth, well, talk about scandalous rumors. Have you all thought about this passage here in Ruth chapter 3? Listen to this. We'll just read through it quickly. Naomi, her mother-in-law, the mother-in-law to Ruth, said to her, to Ruth, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young uh, woman you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself. Put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Yeah, any of you thinking, well, this sounds a little, uh, I don't even know what word to attach to it, but this sounds interesting, huh? What exactly, Naomi, are you telling Ruth to do here? And she replied, all, uh, all that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. I guess that was good if you had cold feet, right? <laughs> at midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay in his feet. I get that that would probably get your attention. And he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. That's probably a pickup line you haven't heard before, huh? But it's actually not a pickup line. Verse 10, and he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. And what he's saying by redeemer, remember uh, the custom back then was when your husband died, then your husband's brother or your husband's family would step up to the plate, so to speak, and take care of you. And so this is what is occurring here. Uh, Ruth's husband has died, and now Boaz is the remaining relative, and it's custom back then was it's his responsibility to take care of her. So she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he's not, this isn't a scandal that he's trying to cover up. It's a thing of, he's saying, there's another redeemer, there's another relative closer to you in relationship than I am. He's got to have the first bid. And uh, so uh, Boaz doesn't want to you know, mess that up in any way. He doesn't want to think that, he doesn't want the other guy thinking, oh, well, he's, you know, she's already given to Boaz, so I, I don't have any rights to her. 
So he's saying, let's just keep this discreet and quiet for now, and we'll see what the other guy says. All right? Now, when you read that, you know, you can be really confused about what is happening there. But if you go to a, a commentary like JFB, and this is just an example, this is what JFB says about this. He says, talking about verse 4, go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. Singular as these directions may appear to us, there was no impropriety in them, according to the simplicity of rural manners in Bethlehem. In ordinary circumstances, these would have seemed indecorous to the world. But in the case of Ruth, it was a method, doubtless conformable to prevailing usage, of reminding Boaz of the duty which involved on him, which devolved, devolved on him as the kinsman of her deceased husband. Boaz probably slept upon a mat or skin. Ruth lay crosswise at his feet, a position in which Eastern servants frequently sleep in the same chamber or tent with their master. And if they want a covering, custom allows them the benefit from part of the covering on their master's bed. Resting as the Orientals do at night in the same clothes they wear during the day, there was no indelicacy. In other words, there wasn't anything scandalous going on in a stranger or even a woman putting the extremity of this cover over her. So you see how that historical context now, you know, you can, okay, I, I get the picture, I see what's happening. Completely foreign to the way we think and operate today, but that's the way it was back then. And so you can, that's just a real good example from the historical context, how you could really misconstrue this story and uh, think something uh, of a scandalous nature is taking place when it's not really that way at all. And so this is just one really obvious example how, um, how history really makes a difference in your understanding. And you know, when we read the Gospels of Jesus and when we read the epistles of Peter or Paul, do you know there's a lot of little nuances in there too? That if you understood historically what took place at that time and those customs, it would just come to life it would really shed a lot of illumination into what Paul or Jesus or Peter were saying. And so uh, get a good commentary. Get used to looking things up on the commentary. You know, find out what's going on in the backgrounds. It really makes a huge difference. Number five, language. This also is a little academic, but it's a, it's a necessary part of the process. But I put there in your notes the translation of the Bible from the original Greek Hebrew and Greek can be difficult, adding obscurity to our understanding. A better understanding of the original languages can bring both correction and greater insight to our interpretation. If, if you don't know any other languages, if all you know is English, or it may be Spanish or French, it, it's hard to really relate to like Hebrew or Greek or Latin. But Hebrew and Greek and Latin are very precise languages. And the Hebrew and the Greek are uh, very descriptive. And you can say something and describe something in Hebrew and Greek that you couldn't even come close to describing the same way in English. That's really the only way I know how to say it. You know, something that may take you one sentence in Hebrew or Greek to say, it would take you like three paragraphs in English to say. That's how limited the English language is. When you get a good grasp on languages, which I don't have, but the English language is very limited. But Hebrew and Greek are very precise, very descriptive. It packs a lot for the punch. And boy, can they really say a lot in those languages. And so I listed there in your notes some concordances and lexicons that you should be familiar with. Again, you can get all of this online now. You don't have to carry around briefcases with big books. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, uh, you got yeah, You have to have one of those, either that or have access to one. You've got to learn how to use that. Every Greek and Hebrew word it has a number, a code attached to it, and by that code you can find out all sorts of wonderful things about that, um, about how things were translated and the original meanings. Englishman's Greek and Hebrew concordance is really good. That's got some features that maybe sometime we can show you, but are, it's really valuable to have. The NAS Exhaustive Concordance, Brown, Driver, and Briggs Hebrew and English Lexicon is really good. Uh, the difference between like the uh, concordance and the, the lexicon, 
in case you've never used the two. A concordance gives you just a simple definition. The lexicon gets into all of the different tenses of the phrases that are used, so it gets into a much more detailed interpretation. Vine's Expository Diction, Dictionary of New Testament Words, is really good. If you want a little bit of a shortcut without getting into all of the concordances and lexicons, then just go to a different translation and begin to compare translations. Because many times that will give you enough insight as to the meaning of the words. And the three that I would recommend are the English Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, which my sister, if, if you remember when she came, she has a uh, doctorate in ancient languages and she uh, does teaching and that type of stuff in ancient languages. She says the RSV is, is, in her opinion, the best and then the New American Standard. And those three versions, and the King James is right up there as well. I didn't mean to leave that out. But those, uh, other than the King James, those three ver versions, are, they were very strict and precise and accurate in their word-by-word -word translation. And that's what you want. If you go with like the Living Bible, that is a paraphrase, and their whole purpose in... in uh, making the, the paraphrase of the Living Bible was to make the Bible readable. And when you try to make the Bible readable, you lose a lot of the accuracy in the translation. But these three, uh, these three translations are actual translations word for word, and they will give you the best understanding of the meaning of words. Okay? Now this is just an example. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. In the King James Version, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Now do you see that phrase in verse 6, thought it not robbery to be equal with God? That is a King James thing. And that's the way they translated it back then uh, in, what, 1611, because that was, when, uh, that was language that the English at that time would understand. I've heard teachers who were promoting the uh, authority of the believer doctrine, which again is not completely wrong. There's a lot of truth in what they brought. But I've heard teachers in the past interpret verse 6 to say, well, see, Jesus didn't think there was anything wrong with saying he was equal with God. So because we are believers and uh, you know, part of Jesus Christ, we can say we're equal with God. And it's not robbery to say that. It's nothing wrong with saying that. And that was the whole basis of, of some of that teaching back then. Well, think about that. Does that sound right to you? No, because we're not equal with God. We are children of God. We are sons and daughters of God. Um, but we can't claim equality with God in the way that they were trying to claim it back then during some of that teaching. But you can see here, Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That is very confusing language for us today sitting here in 2014 in America, right? Now look at how the English Standard Version uh, translates verse 6, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be what? Grasped. So it's saying something completely different, isn't it? What verse 6 is saying, and you see back there in, uh, I put there in the Greek, in the King James, thought it not robbery. That phrase actually means the act of seizing. And in their minds back then, you know, a robber comes into your house and what does he do? He starts grabbing stuff as fast as he can, right? And he's grabbing and holding on to it. That, in the Englishman's mind, that conveyed the thought of, uh, you know, Jesus did not do that. He did not eagerly grab after his deity, but he freely gave up his deity. But the way it's written there can be quite confusing to us today. This, in uh, the ESV, is much easier to understand. He didn't count his equality with God a thing to be what? A grasp. 
to the thing to be grasped. In other words, he emptied himself, as verse 7 says, and he was willing to come down as a man to leave his throne, to leave his glory in heaven, and he was willing to release it and to come down here and become a man for our sake as our sacrifice. So that's a, there are lots of little examples like that. Um, one is in my mind right now, but I think we'll move on. So language becomes also important and another process that has to be taken into serious consideration uh, when you are seeking to be a student of the Bible. Number six, meditation. You know, once you go through all of these other processes of context, uh, comparison, illumination of the Holy Spirit, the history, the language, meditation becomes another equally important part of the process. Meditation I define there as fixing our full focus on the words and the meaning of the scriptures while drawing on the Holy Spirit for the, re for the retraining and transformation of our heart and mind. Our minds have got to be renewed and retrained. And I guarantee you, because I know this is true in my life, but there are thought processes in your brain right now, ways that you think, ways that you grew up or were raised thinking, that you think are okay, but they're actually not. And you, you have just not, you haven't come to that place of illumination yet to realize this is the way I'm thinking and this is contrary to the way God thinks. Now as you grow, at some point, God will reveal that to you, just like he's going to reveal mine to me. But in all of our lives, right now, we are thinking in certain ways that are contrary to the scriptures, and we don't even know it because we haven't received that illumination yet. But meditation is that process to where you really just begin to meditate and mull over and over in your mind and heart the scriptures. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. This is what takes place as you do. Do not be conformed to this world. And again, by context, you know, if, if you just extracted that first phrase out of there, you could say, okay, we don't drink, we don't dance, we don't go with girls that do, or whatever that old saying was, right? It's really not talking about activities or actions. When he's saying, do not be conformed to this world, you see by the rest of the verse that he's talking about the way we think, not necessarily the outward activities. Because watch what happens. Be transformed by the what? The renewal of your mind. So contextually we see that we are not to think as the world thinks. But our minds are going to be renewed. And as our minds are renewed, we will be transformed, which means metamorpho, which is where the English word metamorphosis comes. Transfiguration. Remember when Jesus was transfigured on the mount? And it says that his face shone like the sun. And the three disciples were just awestruck by what was taking place. That word transfigured, that's what's supposed to happen to you and me. As the word of God really takes root in our heart and mind, and that illumination of the Holy Spirit comes, and we begin to meditate on the scriptures over and over again, and you start through that med meditation, you start extracting all of the meaning and all of the wisdom and the heart of God out of that verse, you begin to think a different way. And when you think a different way, your words, your actions, your life will be transformed. That's the power of meditation. And that is when you really start to learn what truth is, because truth is not what you know. Truth is what you live. And until you live it, you really don't know it. It's got to be that real to you. It's got to be that alive to you. The renewal of your mind, and he goes on to say this, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. That's an interesting phrase there, isn't it? By testing. In the, uh, in the King James it says, I think it says approve, that you may, uh, maybe it's just prove, that you may prove, but it, it does have the meaning in the original language of multiple testing. Which means what? We don't always get it right the first time, do we? We read a verse, we hear some teaching, we think this is kind of what God is saying and what he would want us to do, and we do it, 
and maybe we were headed in the right direction, but we need a little bit of a course correction in the process. And so that by testing, we begin to figure out what the will of God is in the decisions and daily circumstances of our life. But it's got to start in the mind. Remember Joshua chapter 1. What did the Lord tell Joshua? Meditate on the word of God how often? Day and night. Day and night. I have learned the hard way, and I'm sure you have too. The moment my mind starts to drift off, to, off the word of God, I'm heading into trouble. The moment my mind starts to drift from the word of God, I'm headed into temptation, I'm headed into lust, I'm headed into depression, I'm headed into fear, I'm headed into something bad when my mind gets off of the word of God. So this process of meditation is fixing our focus on the word of God to be changed so that we start living the word of God because remember it's not truth until you live it. Truth is not what you know. Truth is not what you mentally assent to. Truth changes you and you begin to live it and that's when you know you've come to the knowledge of the truth. Psalms 119, 130. In the King James, if you remember this verse, this is the verse, very familiar verse, that says the entrance of your word gives light. And I'm not saying it in King James ease, but you probably remember that verse that starts with the entrance of your word. Well, that word entrance actually means the unfolding, which I thought was really interesting. See, this is another good reason. This is the ESV, and this is another good reason to study other translations because it really brings a whole nother perspective to the meaning of some of these words, the unfolding of your words. I, I love that as a description of meditation. Isn't that a great description of meditation? The unfolding. You're just, it's like you're unpacking your suitcase and you're pulling this out and you're pulling that out and you're thinking about this and you're looking for that one little small thing that you know you packed away in the corner of the suitcase and you're, you're just pulling it out and you're seeing all that there is to see. And you're discovering it word by word, phrase by phrase. The unfolding of your word gives what? Light and it imparts understanding to the simple. In other words, there's good news for all of us in the room. You don't have to be rocket scientists to figure this thing out. Through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, through the meditation, through the unfolding of the words of God through meditation, even you and I can know what truth is and can hear from God. To this degree, look at Psalms 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation. How long? All the day. Just learn that about yourself. The moment your mind starts to track on something other than the Word, you're, you're heading for trouble. You better get your mind back on the Word of God. Verse 98, your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is what? It is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. And he's not saying this in arrogance of I know better than you, the immaturity of youth. It's not that at all. He's just saying when I unfold the scriptures in my mind and in my heart and meditate on the precepts, it brings to me an excellence. Don't you want to be excellent for God? Don't you want to have a supernatural excellence in what you say and do? You can have it as you meditate on the word of God and it will make you smarter than your enemies, smarter than your teachers because of the wisdom, because of the purity that's in the Word of God. Number seven, application. This becomes really important as well, and this is the last one. I put there in your notes, meditation is knowing God's heart. Meditation is all about God, His Word, unfolding the wisdom of his word. But application is knowing your heart. And boy, knowing our heart is one of the hardest things you and I have to do. It's knowing where and how you need to change to conform to God's word. And I gave you a real clear example of this this morning, in this morning's notes. Matthew 16, verse 13. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, possibly one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? 
and Simon Peter, the same guy that denied the Lord three times, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said unto him, Blessed are you, are you Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. All right, so this is back to what? Number one, illumination. We've got to have the Holy Spirit illuminate the truth to us. But my Father who is in heaven, one of the most exciting things is that God wants to speak to you. Open the book. Begin to read it. And God wants to show you wonderful things. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock of revelation, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That should make you hungry to meditate. Because if God speaks to me, if he opens up his word to me, if his truth really gets established in my heart, then the gates of hell can't prevail against me. They can unleash all of their fury. They can unleash all of the lies of the devil. But it can't rock me. It can't shake me. It can't scare me. It can't move me away because it's upon that rock of revelation and illumination that the church has built. So don't you want to be that secure and stable in your faith? and in your knowledge of God, and not be swayed to and fro. But we all know what happens later in the book, right? Matthew 26, verse 33. Peter answered Jesus, and he said, Though they all fall away because of you, I will what? I will never fall away. Jesus said, You're going to deny me three times. Verse 35. Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Now this brings up a really interesting question. How could Peter be so right about Jesus and yet so wrong about himself? He knew who Jesus was, but he obviously didn't know who himself was. And we are so blind to who we are. That's why it's so good to have a spouse or a friend that you trust who can come to you in gentleness and in meekness and in the right spirit and tell you some things about yourself that may be hard to hear because you and I don't see ourselves for who we really are and we need that outside observation to clarify our perspective. Because we always think the best of ourselves, right? And surely I'm not doing anything wrong and we have a hundred justifications as to why I'm right and sometimes it takes... Uh, a loving sword of a wife or a husband or a close friend to say, you know, this is what you're doing. You need to wake up and see and hear yourself and watch yourself because this really needs to change in your life. But I wanted you to see from the example of Peter, you know, a lot of times we have great insight into who God is, just like Peter did. And we think because I have this understanding and this knowledge and this insight, that means I'm spiritual and I'm doing things well and Maybe not. You may be just as blind to yourself as Peter is. And you need a wake-up call. So what do you do? How, how do you handle this? James chapter 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. This is why I said a moment ago, truth is not truth until you live it. Now don't get me wrong. God's truth is always God's truth. What I'm saying is you haven't arrived at truth until you're living it. Just knowing it is not enough. If you are a hearer only, you are doing what? There's deception in your heart and there's deception in your mind and you haven't come to truth. It's not truth in you until you're doing it. For, anyone who, for, any, uh, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. We all know what that's like. You know, you look into the mirror in the morning and sometimes you really don't like what you see. And you see the wrinkles, you see the blemishes, you see the scars. And the Word of God is much the same way. When you read the Word of God and you're seeing what you are supposed to be, but you know you're not where you need to be, that can hurt, doesn't it? 
And a lot of times our own pride and self-righteousness won't allow ourselves to see us as we really are because it's just too painful. And we don't want to change and we don't want to go through the struggle of trying to change. It's just too much work. So it's easier to just keep Christianity as a Sunday morning thing at church and why even bother trying to change day to day. Look at what he says here in verse 24. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. This is where meditation comes in. Because you're supposed to look into the mirror of the word of God and you're not supposed to walk away and forget. You're supposed to meditate on the word of God how often? Day and night. Day and night. Verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, that's our meditation, the word of God. And look at this next word. You look into the perfect law and you do what? You persevere. You know? If you've got to lose some weight, you go on a diet, it's going to be work. Right? If you need to get in better shape, you go to the gym, it's going to be work. Right? But how come when it comes to spiritual things, we don't want to do the work? It's just too hard. And I don't like what I see in myself anyway, so I'm just going to ignore it and deny it's not there or deny that it is there. He's trying to get us to see in verse 25, this is going to take medica meditation. You're going to have to fix your mind on this and make it your goal and make it the object of your gaze every day. But secondly, you're going to have to persevere. You're going to have to do something about it. Don't just read the word of God and check off that you've done your spiritual thing for the day and not persevere until your heart is changed. You've got to persevere until a change actually begins to take place in your heart. He being no hearer uh, who forgets, but a doer who acts, the doer who acts is the one who's blessed in his doing, not just the one who hears. So you and I, uh, we've got an eternal decision in front of us this morning. Am I just going to hear about the Bible and agree to it and think it's wonderful? Or am I going to persevere as a doer and actually allow my heart and life to be changed? Don't be like Peter who has some great insight into who God is, but you're completely blind to who you are. If the truth is not being lived, you're deceiving yourself. If you're not being changed to be obedient into the image of Jesus Christ, you are deceiving yourself and you haven't come to truth yet. And you know what? You will be very vulnerable to every wind of doctrine that comes blowing down the street because you'll be very gullible and you'll be looking for doctrines that vindicate and justify where you are in life. But if you really want to come to the knowledge of the truth and know that you stand on firm ground when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day, you're going to have to come to truth. And it's going to have to be a truth that hurts at times. It's going to have to be a truth that pierces your heart many times. It's going to have to be a truth that demands change in your everyday decisions and activities. But unless we're willing to make that change, we haven't come to truth. All right, so number one, as we study the Bible, there's got to be illumination. Number two, you've got to read scriptures in context. Don't pull things out of context. Number three, there has to be proper comparison. How does this principle relate to that principle? How does this principle balance out that principle? Four, you've got to have some understanding of the history because if you don't understand the history that's behind the content, you won't understand the content. Uh, fifth, you've got to have some understanding of the language or at least know where to go to get help with understanding the language. If you want a little shortcut, then just take a look at, at some of the other translations. And sometimes they will word something a little differently to give you the help that you need. But then you've got to meditate on the Word of God day and night. That is the unfolding of the truth in your heart and mind. And then there has to be application. Because if you just love to hear the Word but don't love to do it, 
and you're never going to come to truth. Father, we thank you for the precious gift of your word that you've given us. And Father, we ask that the blindness that was in Peter's heart, we pray that it's not in our own heart. We see in the example of Peter's life, we can be right on with so much of our doctrine and have some really great insight into you and who you are, but be blind about who we are. Blind about the condition of our own heart. And if we are, Lord, we won't be ready to stand before you and to be received by you. There were those that cried out, Lord, haven't we done many wonderful works in your name? And they thought they knew. They thought they were right. They thought they knew what God wanted. But their own hearts and lives were not changed and transformed. And they were rejected. So it doesn't depend upon what we know. It really depends upon what we do. And the fact of the matter is we really don't know until we really do. So Father, help us to be doers of the Word of God. Not that we will ever reach sinless perfection because we won't in this life. And it's not that all of our problems and sins and temptations are going to go away overnight because they won't. It's going to be a long process. It's going to be from now until the day we die or are taken home to be with you. It's a lifelong process of always changing and evolving. Father, help us not to be deceived by our knowledge. Help us not to be deceived by our own heart. Give us the clarity to be able to see your scriptures, to see your truth, and to be able to say, this is where I need to change. Father, we thank you for your word to us. And we thank you for doctrine. We thank you for sound doctrine. We thank you for your word, which is our anchor in troubled times. And when every wind of doctrine and belief is blowing through the air from all of these different voices, we thank you, Father, that we have the sure truth and we can be grounded and settled and not moved. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.